we were thinking about doing our own like machine head podcast. I don't really know any of the gear though to get. Like this is a good microphone. Well, you should get any kind of condenser microphone is good because it just makes the voice sound nice and rich and deep. And, okay. And yeah, two of those, a couple of wires. That's kind of the essential piece there. The Zoom yeah, H4. We have this. We have this. Yeah. And then you just bosh, plug it in, I and then I it. use um, Adobe Audition to. I don't really edit the interviews. I tend to just put them out from start to end as they are. Yeah. But obviously, you've got all the software. I'm presuming. Yeah. I mean, do you do any it. like compression after the fact? Or no, no. These these kind of tend to. As long as you're in a good room, like the acoustics in here are pretty good. The one you were in upstairs was a bit echoey, which is what okay. I suggested down here. Cool. But you absolutely should do that. I think more bands should do that because the technology is right there, and it just gives fans that kind of instant. I guess you do it with the blog. Yeah. And you give people that insight into your... Who fucking reads anymore? I read it. Do you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was reading it last night. All right. I wanted to start off, actually. There was um, a really interesting story you told about the guy who used to be, uh, I guess, a Nazi. And you sort of said that you really learned a lot from him and how he owned his mistakes. Mm -hmm. And how you thought we could all sort of take something from that. Because I think you're someone who's always embraced, uh, you know, the, the positive and the negative. And I guess, you know, you're quite open in the fact that you used to be a drug dealer back in the day and you sort of have claimed ownership over that and i wonder if you could just sort of maybe expand on that and tell me a bit about what you think is important with that kind of ownership over mistakeism i did you know you're talking about uh, my friend Anno cromag yeah he used to write for a magazine called ard shock and he passed away a couple of years ago but i met him back in 94 on our first tour with slayer and he just came in and he just kind of bowled you over when you met him. He was a really intense dude and physically you know, big, physically or, yeah. like a tank. I mean, <laughs> what's that word you guys say? A brick shit house. <laughs> He's yeah, a yeah, brick yeah. shit house. <laughs> like, and you know, nice guy, super nice guy. But then, you know, just as we were talking, you know, it was at one point, it just started telling me about how, you know, started showing me his Nazi tattoos and you know that song Realize 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 from Burn My Eyes was you know it's one side of this extreme it's you know black power it's white power and then you know trying to meet somewhere in the middle at the end or whatever so he still had them and would wear he still had them and he was like yeah like I used to be totally fucked up and it was totally lame and you know I was a huge mistake and he started showing me these tattoos he had and swastikas and I was like whoa um and then he just said, you know, something happened and something bad. He never really went into it. Something bad happened, but he changed his life and it totally changed his life. And, you know, his way of changing it wasn't to hide that that's what he was. His way of changing it was to go, this is what I used to be. And it make was, no fuck, sort it's of horrible. Sequel, and but yeah. I, you know, and like to own it. And like that was, that was just such a, uh, I had never met anybody like that up until that point. And it just, it, you know, it shocked me. It impressed me. It kind of made me rethink, I, you know, cause that's just like the way you should be, you know, like we all fuck up. There's going to be things that we do, but he owned it and he moved on and he's like, I'm never looking back. Like I'm never going to be part of that. And I, and now he's the opposite. He, now he is trying to pull people out of that lifestyle. He's trying to do whatever. And then that led me down some other thing called life after hate, which is one of the things that I included in that journal, um, just about a similar guy in Chicago. So yeah, crazy it's a crazy world out there, right? It certainly <laughs> you is. Know, you don't really hear about that side of the story. And in some ways, you know, I almost feel like that side of the story needs to be told more because we get these like really extreme prejudices one way or the other. And, and, you know, you got to look at both sides of it and go, yeah, well, you know, those people who are still in it are fucked. If they can come out great. If they can't, you know, who knows? Yeah, Did you fuck them? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If there is a real inability or an unwillingness to change, then fuck them. Correct. Did you have a moment when you were younger then where you were like, I'm in too deep here or I'm going down a path that I don't want to be going down anymore? Was there like one singular event or was it more a culmination of shady shit that sort hmm. of made you go, okay, it's Definitely time for a like there was there was kind of one there was a couple of moments you know, where I got offered a lot of drugs up front. It was a lot of money. Like a big score a type big, deal. Yeah. And I was like, you know, I, 
you know, here, <laughs> the, the, the most insane, like, retarded logic ever. So just ignore my Rob Flynn 22 year old logic here. But you know, I was really addicted to speed for a long time, like, really, really addicted. I'd lost like 50 pounds, was just like kind of emaciated. And so then somehow I said, well, I need to make money. If I sell speed, it'll force me to stop doing speed because I won't get high off my own supply. And somehow that ridiculous logic worked. It did I work. Stopped, I stopped doing speed because then I was just, you know, speed dealer. And so I the don't Rob know why. Flynn rehab method. <laughs> it was like, like <laughs> don't, don't try that ever. Like, I don't even know why it worked, but somehow it worked. And so, and I started making money and I started making some good money. And, uh, you know, I guess they kind of saw me as some rising star in this thing. And, you know, all I was just trying to do is make ends meet and have fun and just have money. And, you know, singles. I was just like, you know, you're dating strippers and you're just going crazy. You know, it's just fun. The Hollywood it's great. Dream. Yeah. Well, the North Bay Area. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, seven yeah. hours north. So. Yeah. Uh, but you know what I mean? Like, it just got really crazy. And when that kind of big amount of, of money came my way, it freaked me out. Like it really just freaked me out. I was like, whoa, like I, like, I don't want this. Like, I don't, I don't want to do this. Like I'll never get out of this. I'll never get out of this. Scared of getting caught, scared of getting killed. Just like, yeah. And like, you know, I just want to play music. That's all I ever wanted to do. I was in a band, you know, a couple bands before that. This was just like in between bands. And while I was getting machine head going and I was like, I, I, if anything, it became this huge, uh, inspiration to get, make machine head be successful because I just wanted to get away from as far away from that as I could. It's almost like the, the hip hop story, isn't it yours? That kind of idea that you're sort of trying to hustle your way out yeah. of a life of crime by pursuing this sort of creative different, different though, you know, not quite. So, I mean, it was an intent, you know, it's like, you know, you're dealing speed You know, it was methamphetamine. So it was just like a rough, violent, paranoid, you know, everybody's been awake for seven days and, you know, you know, I had a dealer who, you know, he was freaking out and he was getting busted all the time. So anytime somebody came over, he'd make you, he called it, he'd make you suck the glass dick. He'd make you take a hit of dragon's breath. So that means you got to take the glass pipe and do a giant hit of speed. And then when you blow it out, this huge thing of smoke come out of your mouth. So he called it dragon's breath. And, you know, if you do that, like you're not, you're not there to bust them, but you know, like all you're doing to do is like score a little tiny bit. And all of a sudden it's just like, Oh my God, I'm going to be up for two more days now because like, I just had to take this giant hit of speed. And it was a crazy two years of my life. And, and, uh, you know, when I finally did get out of it and machine had sort of taken off, it was just, you know, it really was a huge driving force and, and making machine Head successful. What was, to go back a little bit, what was the years leading up to that like? Did you have sort of, you know, a rough childhood? Was it tough? Um, I mean, it was, you know, we were lower middle class. You know, we had, uh, you know, we weren't poverty, but we were lower middle class. I lived in, you know, I lived, I grew up three blocks away from the trailer park that my dad lived in, you know, and so... In that sense, we were better off than where he was because he was in a goddamn trailer park. But, you know, it was a constant reminder of just like that the, I'm one step away from, you know, I'm one generation one away, from, away yeah. from white trash. And, uh, you know, so, you know, we didn't have a lot of money, but there was, you know, and I was adopted. So, you know, you have these ideas about, you know, everybody kind of knows this family history or this like race or what you are. And, we didn't know what I was. You know, my parents asked for a Irish Mexican baby because my dad was Irish and my mom was Mexican. And they're like, sure, here you go. <laughs> Cause that's so common in California an Irish Mexican baby. And, uh, and you know, so I never really had this like identity with race or this identity with a nationality or anything like that. And, you know, I think for a while growing up, it was, you know, I think it tripped me out. Like I, you know, you feel kind of not part of any thing and man, like when I look at the world now, I'm so fucking glad that 
that I didn't have any of that bullshit in my head growing up because I look at all this like crazy nationalism that's happening all over America and even in other parts of the world. And I'm like, who fucking cares? Like how stupid, you know, whatever the race or your color, your skin or this, like I never fucking knew. Like I'm just a mutt. That's it. And you know, we ended up, we lived in that area of San Lorenzo, for a while and it was like lower middle class by the time i was a teenager i was just in a fucking california suburb you know like 60 miles away from the city and it was just a it's just a big giant suburb you know it was like skaters and in some ways it was like that suburb culture especially back in the 80s was just rife for you know just vandalism and (laughs) and kids teenagers getting into trouble and so that's what we did. We just got into trouble and there was a lot of like skateboarding and there was a lot of, you know, hanging out with punk rockers and we started going to metal shows and started going to punk shows. And it was just, it was a great, you know, in a lot of ways, it was just a great time. We were just like, there wasn't really like, we, I mean, we were just assholes. <laughs> you know, We would just do the most ignorant shit that I was just like, God damn, I used to do that. Fuck. <laughs> Could you give us an example? We used to typical... dr- we used to drive around. I had I'd, I'd steal my dad's car because my dad went to sleep really early and he he was a baker, so he would uh, he would wake up at two a.m. and so he would basically be asleep around like seven p.m. and so I'd steal my dad's car and we'd go load up my his car with a bunch of rocks like about you know eight to ten inches big and pretty heavy and we'd just drive through the neighborhood and lob rocks out at like 40, 50 miles an hour and just throw them through people's car windows you know just like ignorant i remember just this one house had this huge window and we we're like we should throw a rock through that window like <laughs> so we just like five windows went through the, the dude must have just been like what the fuck because it was just nobody like some random house that just had an awesome window and there we were just like fucking this dude's shit up like we didn't even know who he was never course, met him yeah, like never yeah. did anything wrong to us i was like god yeah never out of malice just out of like boredom and totally, as you say like totally. teen ignorance yes it's funny, I was watching a sketch last night and there was this guy who's doing a bit about how nowadays as a parent you can track literally where your kid is Important if they've got the right? iPhone. Yeah. And he was saying, you know, back in the the 70s, the 80s, even the 90s when I was growing up, you could, once you were like out for the day, mm-hmm. your parents didn't know where you were. You oh, were my free. parents knew where I was. They did. Oh, yeah. Totally. They'd roll up sometimes. I'd be all stoned over at the arcade and they'd be like, grab me by my hair. You get it. I know you've been smoking weed. My mom did that one time. I was like, how the fuck did you find me? <laughs> did you have brothers or sisters, either biological or with the, oops, sorry, or the adopted family? Did you grow up around I, you know siblings I, or were you an only child? I, I had, I didn't, I mean, they, my parents couldn't have kids. So right. that's why they adopted me. But my, my the rest of my family was really dysfunctional as well as my family but everybody else around them was really dysfunctional so the parents would like go away like my uncle my dad has a twin brother his uncle and so he joined a cult like re- when i was really young and so his his i always had cousins living at our at my house so our house was like this kind of transitory like if you were having a problem with your crazy uncle or my crazy aunt you stayed with us so for long periods of time i'd have three brothers you know or i'd have you know two two sisters and a brother and then they'd go away and then they'd come back and then i or i'd have another set of cousins come and live with us so it was it was a trippy life you know because you got used to having kids around you got used to having you know to share everything and then it just end you know and in some ways it was like lonelier because I, you get so used to having that many people around my uncle always lived with this my uncle was a paranoid schizophrenic what and was so the cult that he joined what he was joined it? he just joined some crazy he's actually still in it right <laughs> he's still in it he joined some crazy religious cult where you tithe all your money to the main jesus guy so they all work and he doesn't work and and then they just give their money to him and he just basically up and left his family and his kids and just fucking and we i remember going up there with my parents trying to like get him out yeah and you know i wasn't really clear on what we were doing and now my dad told me later on why we went up there and it was just some you know, some crazy hippie commune in the middle of the fucking 60s Oregon. dream gone bad right yeah some like in the middle of Oregon and everybody's smoking weed and they're just like they just think this dude's some disciple and it didn't work we we you know we tried but it didn't work and uh, it was just weird you know so I always had this 
you know, again, like having this very un, a disconnect to race, a disconnect to um, nationality, and a real disconnect with religion. Like just totally turned off by religion, seeing that kind of shit and seeing what he did to my cousins and seeing just what he did. And, you know, from a very young age going like, yeah, man, <laughs> like, I don't know. I don't know about all this stuff. It's crazy, isn't it? Because I think that often with stuff like that, it's usually like there's a lot of women around as well. It's often like a very almost like misogynistic patriarchal situation, isn't it? Where you get these one dudes yeah, who are like right. the messiah yeah, and like usually 50, just because they want to just get laid wives. all the time. Yeah, I don't know if it was like that. I can't, you know, honestly, it's not very clear. Yeah, yeah. I just remember like, I remember, you know, more kind of big picture details about it. Nice. We're getting a good insight into the man. I like it. Um, at school, were you sort of someone who engaged with academia? I mean, as far as I remember, I don't <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's been a while. Was I pretty good? I think I was pretty... I'll just say I was pretty good. I'll say I'm, I'll make myself straight sound smart. Straight A student. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I was yeah. a straight A student. Rewrite your own history. I, uh, no, I, know I, did, I know I did good in some things. Um, you know, I was pretty bad at sports. I was not very athletic. And I... You know, I was pretty like I think I mentioned this to you that I was I was pretty quiet. I was really introverted. Um, didn't have a lot of friends. I just kind of you know I don't know if I kept to myself. I had some friends, but it wasn't like you know you meet some guys and they were like the fucking class clown or they were the fucking star of the football team. Like, like a type. That, that was not me. I was uh, you know I bet you most people wouldn't even really remember me until probably like high school when I started like just acting out but uh you know i just i was really into star wars i was i wasn't really into any of the typical sports of football baseball any of that but i was crazy about bruce lee so i was obsessed with bruce lee and so my dad started taking me to uh this guy uh this jujitsu uh place in alameda with this guy wally J. and wally J was a pretty well-known teacher in the in the area and this dude was awesome like just totally took me under his wing and and i mean i would get there half an hour early and start preparing for class you know i would stay half an hour after class and i would just spar with him and wrestle with him and he's like you strong strong like bull and i just remember him always saying that to me and he just like, gave me a lot of confidence you know like really just like made me just you know see that I could do this and I got good I got to be an orange belt which is about halfway up the jujitsu chain and then we moved and I kept on trying to go I con- tried to continue there but uh it was a pretty it was a big drive you know my parents worked and and my dad obviously like I said he got up early so we ended up just switching me to another dojo in Fremont where we moved to and it was like, it just wasn't the same vibe. Like the teacher was totally different. The vibe, you know, it was like at a high school gym and it was just like a totally different vibe. And now I was 13 and I was sparring against people who were, you know, kids who were 14 and 15. And even though that doesn't seem like that big of a difference, it is that, like yeah, it was yeah. a big difference. Like I was a gangly kid and these dudes were turning into men and they were kicking my ass, like beating the fuck out of me when we sparred. And I was like, fuck this shit. And I quit. And within two weeks, I had smoked weed for the first time. I was going to ask bl- when did the party Black come Sabbath in? at the same time as I smoked weed for the first time. <laughs> and it was like my life just went, Pachoom! like I just went in a totally different direction. Isn't that funny how the sort of spike in the road can occur just almost so out of nowhere and it can have such a profound, lasting impact on your life? Right. And I think when you're 12, 13, 14, that's when it all happens in it? I think whatever you're going to become, obviously people evolve and change over the years, but I do really feel like out of everyone I've had on this show that everyone has that kind of moment in the teen kind of window where they see the path ahead of them and they're kind of like, that's me, this is it. I don't even know if, I mean, you're putting, you know, you're giving me a lot of, uh, <laughs> a lot of grace right there. <laughs> I, I mean, it definitely was not that clear. I was no. like, this is what I'm going to do. When did I the just, music take I just felt them? like, I just... To me, it just, it resonated with me so much that I 
I just decided I was going to be, I don't know, like be different, you know, that I was changing right then, you know, I don't even know if I said those words. It's just what some feeling I had. Um, did the sort of music take hold later then when you decided you wanted to, you know, no music that was path? always, that I was, was always crazy there. Was it? about music from, you know, my earliest memories, having talking my parents into buying me singles and memorizing all the words so that when it came on the radio, I could sing along and, and, uh, you know, going 45s because I was, you know, of course I'm older, but, uh, it was, the decade it was all about, single, yeah, it? it was, it was all about singles and, uh, you know, so we would do that. I would try out for the school play and, you know, I always wanted to be on stage. I loved being on stage and I could do that. Like, even though I was really introverted, I could try out for a school play and then have be bold enough to say, I want to be the main guy. You know, like I want to be Peter rabbit. And and I was able to do that. I could memorize lines. And in some ways, it was like you could be somebody else. And I kind of liked that idea. And and then just music came along. And I think, uh, who was it? My first, I think my first kind of musical instrument experience was my buddy Vance had a bass. And we were listening to Black Sabbath. And the beginning of NIB came on. And I was super distorted. I was like, I thought it was a guitar. I was like, I want to play guitar, man. That sounds fucking awesome. And he was like, dude, that's the bass. And I was like, really? I was like, that's a fucking rad sound. You know, like I want to make that sound. He's like, and he had a bass. So he's like, dude, play the bass. And so I kind of got into that and just kind of noodled around. My dad had an acoustic that he bought at a flea market, like literally just $45 only had four strings. They were all black <laughs> with rust. And, and I just would sit there and play that. And, you know, I remember just learning like super basic songs, like, like a Led Zeppelin song. And then my buddy taught me how to play sweet leaf by black Sabbath. And he was like, do you know what a power chord is? And I was like, no. <laughs> and he's, he's like, if you hit this string and this string, it makes a power chord and I did it and I was like, Oh, that's that sound. You know, that's what all the, that's what all those songs sound like. And so, you know, just went down the rabbit hole, started digging, got into Ozzy, got into Randy Rhodes and Gary Holt Exodus, you know, so that's kind of the beginning of, of instrumentation and learning a craft 15, 15 or so. Have you spent much time with the Sabbath guys? Do you know those dudes? I would, I know them and I wouldn't say I spent much time with them, but definitely like, you know, toured with them, toured with Tony Iommi three times, uh, geezer three times, Ozzy once we did a tour with that first black Sabbath reunion that happened in 97. We were on Ozfest at that time. Nice. So was he partying at that point or was he straight? Uh, I don't know. I don't know if he was, I don't think he was, I think he might've been, he might have been off booze, but I'm not sure. I can't even remember. You know, like he I said, he wasn't going wild. Though. He wasn't going wild. Yeah. He definitely wasn't going <laughs> wild. And, you know, it's not like they really, they didn't, you know, they'd show up right before the show. They'd play, jump in the van and go. So yeah, it's not yeah, like yeah. you were really hanging out with Black Sabbath or anything, even yeah, though yeah, yeah. you're on tour with them. Although there was one time when we were hanging out and Ozzy had to cancel a show at the last minute. And they started talking to all the various singers if they knew Black Sabbath songs because Black Sabbath still wanted to play. It was a sold out show in Columbus, Ohio. And it was like, hey, like Black Sabbath's probably going to play without Ozzy and have all of the singers from the OzFest package sing on, with Black Sabbath. Do you know any Black Sabbath songs? And I'm like, do I know any Black Sabbath songs? <laughs> like. I'm your dude. Like I know every lyric. I know every melody. I'm like, so we get, you know, we get taken into the, uh, to the Aussie. So it was black Sabbath and Aussie. So Aussie Osborne band was playing and black Sabbath was playing. Ozzy was doing, so double he was duty. pulling double duty. He was wow. doing double duty. Yeah. I don't think he was partying, you know, cause I don't know if he would have been able to pull that yeah, off. Yeah. So we go into the Aussie room and the Aussie band is like, yeah, we're going to do, we're going to do Aussie songs with all these different singers. And what song do you know? And I'm like, I'll do crazy train. And Marilyn Manson's there. And he's just like, I want to do crazy train. I was like, cool. Let's do it together. Like, all right, fuck yeah. And so we start talking and then Tony and geezer come into the Aussie band dressing room and they're like, 
we think we're going to do the Black Sabbath songs too. So we'll play as well and have all this stuff. Do you know any Black Sabbath songs? I'm like, dude, of course. So they're like, hey, come into our dressing room. <laughs> and so there I am being escorted by Iomi and Geezer into their dressing room with a couple of other guys about what Black Sabbath songs I'm going to sing with Black Sabbath tonight. <laughs> and I'm sitting there staring at these two and then flashing back to looking at the album cover for Sabbath Bloody Sabbath, which I must have stared at for 24 hours of my life going, this is the fucking raddest album cover I've ever seen. <laughs> and just how much Black Sabbath is, you know, meant to me and it was just like this surreal amazing like a moment I'll never forget in the end Black Sabbath decided not to play without you know they were just like we can't do this without Ozzy but the Ozzy band did play and we got up there and I fucking I jammed you know crazy train with Marilyn Manson and something with Burton from Fear Factory and Dimebag and me saying fucking bark at the moon and oh my god it was fucking crazy what a beautiful full circle moment dude it was it was this this crazy full circle moment you know what I mean what was the first band to take you guys under their wing I'm just trying to get some party stories out of you essentially is the goal here (laughs) Um, when Machine Head is starting out and they're hitting the road was there uh, you know a band that was bigger than you at that point that was kind of like Come here, let's fucking raise a glass and raise some hell. Any stick out? Slayer. Yeah? For sure, Slayer. You know, we did, uh, I mean, you know, in a, in a weird way, we had like a really big break right off the bat. I mean, we did, the first tour we did with Burn My Eyes was uh, Napalm Death and Obituary in the U.S. And we were opening, sharing a bus with Napalm, and... It was, it was, I mean, it was a great tour for us. It was a huge break. You know, that was a great, you know, those bands were both doing really well. Their audience hated our guts because we were, you know, singing here and there. And, and you know, there's a couple of cities where we did well, but for the most part, it was a pretty rough tour. And then, uh, and you know, the record came out in America and Burn My Eyes did, you know, nothing. It's, I mean, it did like 1,100 copies its first week, which, you know, for a new band is solid. Over here, though, it was crazy. Like, it started at number 24. Like, we had like, you know, they, had, they brought me on MTV over here and, it, you know, I guess all the people up there liked me. And so, um, you know, it just really took off here. And in Europe in general, you know, and MTV still had Headbangers Ball. It was gone in America. So they played the Davidian video. It was pretty successful. So it was kind of a no brainer for Slayer to bring us out because here's this hot new band and they're going back out on tour for the first time. And so they brought us out. And, you know, for me, that shit was like dream come true. You know, I had seen Slayer more than any other band leading up to that point i mean we used to drive to la drive to sacramento like we were crazy about that even when you know i was selling drugs i guess it's like that shit was the jackpot a slayer show everybody wanted to buy speed <laughs> so <laughs> so like i'd go there and i'd make a hell of money too so it was like you know very very uh important band and then you know we get this tour we're supporting them and you know that was back when like you like bands got you know you always hear about that legendary slayer crowd you get slayered off the stage like that was when you got slayered the fuck off of the stage and uh there was a couple of times when it happened but for the most part you know it really like we held our own and it was it was like trial by fire man because not, i mean i remember walking out on stage in chicago illinois Every single person in the front row was flipping us off. Slayer! Slayer! And I was like, holy shit. You know, like, all right, all right. let's do this. <laughs> you know, like, fucking try. And in some weird way, it was, there was so much anger and there was so much intensity that if you could turn it around somehow. Channel it right. You yeah. could win them over, you know, because it was just so fucking extreme. And, you know, a lot of nights we did that. And those guys, those guys were awesome. I mean, it was just amazing to watch a show of that level, you know, right off the bat and see how they did it and see how, you know, just kind of learn from it. Look at the light show, look at the production, look at like how they ran their operation. And it was, it was awesome. And that, you know, they took us carry. I mean, I, I credit all the world for Kerry King, man. He really just, he loved it. And he, you know, we broke down with him and he took us out and then they took us out in America too. So we did five months right off the bat with Slayer. Wow. Yeah. And it was like, it, How was, old are you at that br- point? it was brutal because it was, you know, again, that super brutal Slayer crowd. So 
you sank or swim. Like yeah, if yeah. you didn't cut it as a live band, you would get fucking mauled, you know? And we, we had biohazard above us in the U S so it was even, you know, a lower spot for us. And we watched biohazard get slayed off the stage night after night. And we were like, fuck man, we can't let that happen to us. Like we've got to, I don't know what we got to do, but we've got to fucking kill it. And you know, you learn something from that. You learn just how to perform. You learn how to command the stage. I, I was probably below average front man at that point. And you know, that just forced me to kind of learn how to communicate to an audience. Do you have any bands that are coming up now that you look at and think like, I'd like to take them on tour. I'd like to kind of give them a leg up. Is there any out there that I'm are pretty, doing it? I'm pretty impressive? out of it when it Maybe comes you sort to of like tapped out of a lot of the, the newest stuff. I, you know, like I, you know, I'm 50 years old, man. Yeah, of course. Like I <laughs> fucking family man. Busy. I mean, yeah, I got kids when I'm home. I'm a boring suburban dad. <laughs> you Where's know home? I mean? Where like, do you live? I live in Martinez, which right. is, you know, just eat about 20 minutes east of Oakland. You know, it's just a suburb. I got fucking fire trails that right outside my back and I take my dogs on hikes every day. And, you know, it's, it's pretty chill. And, you know, if me and the, if I'm hanging at home, like, you know, I'm gone for so long. I go on tour for 20 months, dude. We did 283 shows on the last tour cycle. Like I'm gone for a really long time from my family. So when I hit, when I'm home, it's like, I'm hanging out with them. And basically if I'm listening to music, I'm listening to what my crummy kids want to listen to. You know, the 13, 10, like my teenager walks around with, you know, the headphones all day, listening to hip hop and like, Hey buddy, I need you to take out the garbage. I don't care. I don't care. <laughs> Fine. Fine. You know, it's like that kind of, I'm like, that's my biggest challenge is to get my kid to like get ready for school or yeah, yeah, yeah. whatever. And so, <laughs> you know, I listen to, I, you know, I try and keep my ear to the street, but honestly, like, I'm, you know what I'm into? I'm into podcasts. I'm into Howard Stern. I could listen He's to the fucking, king. I listen to Howard Stern every fucking day. If I get in my car and I'm driving to practice, I don't want to listen to some fucking band. I want to listen to Howard Stern. The fucking interviews are so good. The fucking sh the drama between all the fucking crew, you know, the cast and the it's so fucking funny. It's so interesting. And then if I'm not listening to Howard Stern, I'll listen to hip hop because I find hip hop to be far more uh, extreme. And, you know, I will love that it's taken lang the language of music to some extreme that no other music forms are taking it or I'll listen to Joe Rogan or I'll listen to the WTF or I'll listen to the Alec Baldwin all podcast or like all Baldwin just like, do one? I didn't know he did one. Baldwin, What's the premise yeah, it's of his? Called, it's called here's the thing. Does he yeah. interview or is it like, he, yeah, yeah, he interviews and it's super good, dude. He had David Letterman on there and the fucking David Letterman interview would draw, you know, like I don't American. I grew up with David Letterman. Yeah. Yeah jaw dropping like the shit that he got him to talk about I was like holy shit like you know or I'll watch TV you know I'll watch Game of Thrones I'll watch fucking Breaking Bad I'll watch House of Cards like TV to me is so amazing now like long form storytelling and long sh you know this really like Game of Thrones is fucking great the best shit it is it's the best shit and it's got super violent brutality treachery sex galore just yeah. funny fantasy you know just That's gay sex <laughs> you know they're pushing every you know Renly Baratheon's getting blown by Loris Tyrell and you're like what the <laughs> fuck is going on they're just pushing every envelope and it's amazing it's 10 times more entertaining to me than any metal band that's for certain I love so that. I just do that and that if anything that's what that's what really inspired this album. Not another band, not another music, shit like that. Who has Stern had on recently that's just blown you away? Because that's all live, isn't it, his show? He just gets guests in live. Can you fucking Cause he gets other that? He gets other stars calling in, doesn't yeah. he, whilst there's a guest on, which I love. Yeah. I mean, can you just believe all of that live five days a week? Think about how much work that is and how much content you got to create and how much research and just like spontaneous crap. Everybody's yeah. got to air their laundry. Everybody has to air their grievances. Like everybody's got to put their flaws on blast for not just everybody at the Howard Stern show to go, Oh fuck this, that or the other thing. But then 30 million listeners, <laughs> you know, like God, dude, it's, 
it's incredible. And you, you know, you hear so much stuff. I mean, what was the last interview that really blew me away? You know, where someone was just super amazing. Um, you know who it was? It was the dude from, uh, the walking dead. What's the new bad guy on the walking dead? Um, I haven't seen that show. I don't know. The okay. New guy. He's uh, he's like the new bad guy right, right. on the show. Big actor, famous brutal. actor. I don't, he's not really a famous actor. I didn't really know him, but he had such an interesting story. You know, like there's just so many. I mean, sometimes you get like uh, what's that one dude from Saturday Night Live? He was on there recently. He got in the car accident. Um, Jamie. I'm so shitty with names. Here I am. Like, now I, like, this is a great interview, but I can't remember the fucking remember name. It it's just, you know what? They go on great. there ready to just spill all, though, don't they? I think it's just out of respect for him. Like, yeah. he's Rachel so Maddow revered. was awesome. Rachel Maddow from MSNBC. Yeah, yeah. I think she's fucking awesome. And she, it was amazing. It was amazing listening to her just tell her stories. Um, they had the other dude. They had Anderson Cooper on there. You know, his mom was like one of the Vanderbilts. And then apparently like a total like sex crazed woman. And like it's well known that she was like very promiscuous. And, and like I was just like, you know, Who you just hear that? all this crazy yeah. shit about people's lives. And you just, you know, sometimes they talk about they had one guy on there and he was like, I forget, it was a pretty famous actor. And he was telling a story about how he was he was hanging out with somebody in Manhattan and they were getting ready to go to a play. And they're like, oh, we're bringing a friend. And they wouldn't say who the friend was. And then in walks, you know, Jackie Onassis Kennedy. And he was like, holy shit, you know, like and, you know, she's just talking and she walked up and she's like, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to go this way and you're not going to look at me and you're going to. And they went in and they hung out at this place. But like they had to be all these rules because everybody, you know, second she walks in, all eyes are on her. And, that shit. Yeah, it was just crazy stories you know and even just like it's not even the famous people that you hear that you get all of the i don't even know wisdom out of it's the it's the freaks you know it's the freaks it's the callers it's tan mom it's jeff the drunk it's like all of the just the dude you know they'll sit there jeff the drunk smoking weed and he's got this fucking hideous cough you know just like <laughs> and it just goes on you're like oh my god and it's just so fucking hideous but it, you can't stop fucking listening because it's just like those little human things and uh it's uh, that's the shit that i love man a good conversation can you know that fires my blood more than anything nowadays going back to what we were saying at the start as well just about i guess being real vulnerable exposed mm -hmm. honest yeah owning it for better or worse right putting it out there how did being a dad change your life just as we get to the final straight i just like to sort of find how out a what? Bit. becoming a dad becoming, becoming a father a dad. does that force you to reassess certain like a lifestyle for sure i mean you you everything changes in your life you know what i mean like you're you go from being number one with, you know, I was number one with my wife, like center of the universe. <laughs> and then like we have kids and you become like number 10 on the list. You're like, the hey, help. what the fuck? <laughs> and, uh, you know, like you, you know, it's, and it's all really subtle. You know what I mean? Like, it's never like, there's never some big change. It's all just a bunch of little changes along the way. And, and then you change. And then one day you look back and you're like, wow, I, I've really changed. And you don't notice it, you know, and, and because I'm a public figure and people are constantly asking about moments of my life, which I never look at in any kind of context because I'm just living it. And you notice you've changed. And you're like, I, like, I don't swear at home. I swear on stage like crazy. I swear like crazy in my songs. But when I'm at home, I don't want my kids hearing me swear. Because, and I don't want them going around swearing because everybody always looks at me already going, oh, I'm fucking, his crummy kids are probably terrible. I'm like, no, my kids are going to be, my kids are good. And Do you find I, that I haven't played, around the playground that you're getting judged because you're like a metal guy as other, you know, other I parents? Think, you know what? Most parents, they're kind of like, I don't feel that, you know, but I think most parents are kind of like, Ooh, we got a secret star at our school. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. If, if anything, it's almost like weirder in that sense yeah, because yeah. then it's like, Oh, they want me to do all these like things. Cause I'm in a band and I'm like, yeah. 
you don't even know who I am. Like, yeah, you've yeah, never yeah. heard my music. Like, come on. You know? And, uh, and so that, that's a different kind of weird. Yeah. With my kids though, I haven't, I haven't played them most of my songs. They've never heard Imperium. They've never heard I Am Hell. They've never heard uh, Davidian. They've never heard fuck it all. <laughs> yeah, I don't want them to hear that shit. You know, there's, there's going to come a time when when that's okay. And obviously they've seen me live and they know that data, you know, it's funny because my oldest son, the first time he saw us live, you know, standing on the side of the stage, we're opening with Imperium, middle fingers up, you know, fuck, fuck these, you know, all this stuff. And he turned to, turned to Ginevra and he's like, mama, dad, swears a lot on stage. And she was like, you know, just laughs because <laughs> it was so new to him. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so now, you know, they went through a phase where, you know, they're, they're, 13 and 10 now, but a couple of years ago when they saw us, they went through a phase where they were like flipping, flipping you each other off. Right. And you know, it's, it's one finger over in America as opposed to two over here, but they're like doing it to each other. And we're like, we had to have a talk with them. Like, all right guys, you know, we can't be doing this outside. Like it's one thing to do it here at the house to your brother, but you know, don't be running around the freaking school, like flipping everybody <laughs> off. <laughs> But they came to the show, and there I am opening with Imperium, and they're up in the balcony. And so my wife turns to both of them, and, and I'm like, get your metal fingers. And she turns to him, and she's like, now you can flip everybody off. And they just stood there in the balcony, all, yeah, <laughs> like just flipping everybody <laughs> off. And I was like, yes. <laughs> That's what's good. up. And fame, what would be your thoughts on that? You've obviously danced with it a bit. Um, I mean, in recent years, without going too dark at the end, it's obviously probably been the cause of certain, you know, lives being lost within this world. Mm -hmm. Cornell and Chester being I know, right? examples. Horrible. Um, Horrible. I was really hit by that Cornell one. That one just, that fucked me up, man. Like, I was shook. Then it opened up all these feelings that I had buried and, and, uh, it was a really intense, like, you know, I wrote a couple of journals about it and like, just, and I said all that and I said all of that and tried to, and then read all these people's responses and just trying to, trying to figure it out in real time with a bunch of people. You know what I mean? Like, that's what I, that's what I get out of music. You know, music helps me kind of figure it all out in some way and seeing everybody else not <laughs> being just as confused and just as lost as I am helps me feel uh, better about a lot of stuff and fame you know a lot of people hold me in a regard that I don't feel about myself you know I, I'm the guy who just wakes up and you know I look at my fucking old fat ass and go, <laughs> but they see me in some other way. And I just, you know, I can't, I try not to let that, you know, affect anything about me. Like I know who I am and I know how, and I feel like I just got to try and, you know, you try your best to stay grounded. You try your best, you know, it is difficult touring and living this kind of alternative life where you just go from city to city and you have no connection and you're a gypsy. But in another way, it's the only thing I've done for 30 plus years now. And I don't really know any other life and, you know, lots, of, you know, lots of people hold me in this high regard. And I guess as long as they're not bringing the cross and the nails, I'm all good with that. You know, but when they start bringing that shit, I'm like, I'm out of here. Yeah. 